Amen. That was great. A great song for tonight. Thankful once again uh, for God's love in our life. Yeah. Thankful for each one of you. I am thankful for our instrumentalists, those who uh, work hard. Uh, they put in hours preparing their music and making sure they can play it and, uh, and us understand what they're playing. And uh, I am so thankful for all that. Uh, for our interpreters who put time into practice to make sure they're ready as well. I'm just thankful for each and every one of you for your faithfulness. Hebrews chapter tw uh, 4 tonight. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at one verse here tonight. We're going to begin a study tonight that I'm kind of excited about. And uh, uh, just something to guide. I, I started normally on Wednesdays. I'll study uh, during the day for, for the ninth service. And uh, usually, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well, pretty well know what I'm going to preach and Today, it just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, so it's becoming a series. I preached it all night and here until who knows when. Uh, so uh, we're going to turn it into a couple of night series, so I, uh, we'll use it on Wednesday nights. Uh, but I'm excited about it, and uh, hope, I hope it'll work in, in our lives. And uh, Look, God's Word is an amazing thing. Yes. And so many times we so overlook it and so... Uh, misuse it. Proverbs, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 4, the verse that we're going to look at, verse 12, the Bible says this, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Father, we sure need you tonight. God, I pray, I know that you've been working in my heart and my life today, and, and I beg of you tonight to just clear my mind of my thoughts and fill me with yours. God, that's what your people need. They don't need me, they need more of you. And God, I pray that you give them that tonight. I pray that you be with those that are that are dealing with loss right now, the loss of family members, Father. I pray that you just uh, strengthen them, encourage them, comfort them. I pray that you uh, just be with those that could not be here because of physical restraints tonight. Keep them safe. And I pray that once again you encourage them, build them up, strengthen them. Use us as a church to do that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When you stand outside this building, when you drive up, what do you see? What do you see? Steeple. Steeple. Okay, what else do you see? Thank you, Brother What else do you see? Ma'am? The building. The building. All right. What kind of building is it? It's a church building. What else do you see? Help me out. Come on. Doors. doors. There you go. Doors. Lights. Flowers on the doors. I know. It's beautiful out there. I love the fact that people keep this place, you know, with flowers and things. Love it. What else do you see? Yeah. Trees. The owls above the door. Oh, I so need a matching set of those owls. They get me every time. I'm like, ah! They don't match. They're great. I know why they're there. They've got a reason they're there, okay? But, oh, I'm one of those weird guys matching how many, oh, <laughs> love them. But anyways, uh, we see, these are the things we see. Now, I'm posing that because many times we don't see what God wants us to see. We overlook what God's given us and what he desires of us and from us. You know, too many in the neighborhoods around here, can I tell you what they see? As bad as it sounds, and it's, it's, it's many times it's just because uh, they, they don't understand. But they see a, uh, a, a clubhouse. Makes them think of a yacht club. A place where people are members of and they pay their dues and they come and they have their groups or their cliques. That's what they that's what they see. And it's not that they're trying to overlook that it's a church. It's just their mindset of what a church is. To some, they just see a hangout spot. Because a lot of churches, that's what they've become. They've become a place to just hang out and have fun and they might get some preaching. Normally they'll just get rock music. That's what they've become. So even when they see our church, that's what they think of as just a hangout spot. I've 
been uh, convicted, and I have shared this conviction with you in and, and many of my messages before, but we, when we pull on to this, to this property, we have a beautiful building. We have a beautiful steeple. We have a beautiful land. Um, God has so richly blessed, and there are so many men and women that have blood, sweat, and tears this building into, into building it and, uh, and the purchase of everything. But can I tell you, more than when we drive on this property, should we see a church, we should see a hospital. This location should be, we should see, I want you to, in your mind, maybe it's been a long time, maybe it's just been recent since you've seen an emergency room. I, with my kids and my family, I've seen many. Uh, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, the hustle and bustle, the people desiring to get in and get in quick, the people with hurts and, and questions and needs and, and not understanding what's going on with them. But we have a lost and dying world if that's what people are going through out there. And they don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. They don't know what, what's the answer to help me. It must be a hospital. Hospitals play an indispensable role in our lives. I'm talking about medical hospitals. Medical staff is trained for future generations. I've seen uh, when my wife was in, in the hospital for the extensive time she was, uh, many uh, people training, they bring in, the main doctor come in, and he has an entourage with him of like five or six other people with him that are training, and they're training for future generations. There, there's a medical, I, I always love the term practice. They're practicing on you. <laughs> Look, they don't know what, they don't know how to heal you. They're practicing. They're going based on what they've seen in the past, what they think should work, but it might not, to try to help you. But their medical practice is performed. People are enabled to get over their ailment. In other words, they're given uh, medicines that help their body. I want you to understand it's not the doctors that heal us, it's God that heals us. He's given us an amazing body that heals itself. They give us the medicines and things that help our body heal ourselves. But God gives them the skills to form, to form the surgeries. God gives them the skills to know what to do and how to do it. But I want you to understand, there's, people are enabled, we're enabled to get over our ailment, and people are rehabbed. People are helped and, and shown what to do to get back on their feet. Some of people don't like that rehab. In fact, they, they'd rather not. Um, but it worked, did it not, Miss Kathy? I mean, she, uh, I, every time I saw her, she wanted to rough up the guy that was, working, that was working on. You know what they made me do this week or today? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, they probably roughed you up. Yeah, they did. You know, and uh, but they, there's rehab going on. There's people helping people get back to where they can they can do things on their own. They can go their own way. That's a physical hospital. Can I tell you, we should be doing the same things as a spiritual. Hospitals. Hospitals have doctors, nurses, nurses assistants, secretaries, janitors, um, and many other various members of their staff. Each one of them has tools to use to help the sick. Now, tonight I'm going to get to a part, get to a point, but I have somebody to bring this. This is called a jump bag. I learned that today. What did I call it earlier, Brother Keith? A craft bag. <laughs> that sounded even better, doesn't it? Uh, but it's a jump bag. It's for EMTs. Emergency medical technicians. Is that right? Good. This is what they carry. This is when it when it's time to jump, if you will, to go, they make sure they have this bag. Because inside this bag they have all sorts of tools. Now I'm not gonna I, I don't think I should open it because it's probably got tools I better not be touching. No? But uh, let's let's look. I, I want to. I just look. I told you this is going to be a series, so I can. 
And they told me down there I have to go as long as I want because they've got some special plans tonight, doing cards and stuff. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But inside there's all sorts of, I mean, this bag is crammed full of stuff. And these are all tools they use when they go on on their calls. I was hoping, I love the color, it's green, the stethoscope. You know, I've always wanted, they always go, you know, to make sure they hear when they put them in here. I always want to go, hey! I don't, but, you know, I always think about it. But these are tools. These are tools that they use for emergencies when, they, when they're on the, the spot. We're going to talk about EMTs in just a minute. And the important role that they, that they perform. I want you to understand, part of the oath the doctor takes, and I was reading different oaths, and they, it goes all the way back in history to different oaths. And, you know, part of it, part of one of the oaths that I saw, and I don't know if they use this one still today, because like I said, there's so many, but the most recent one I could find, do you realize that part of the oath the doctor takes when they graduate is, above all, I must not play God. I must not play God. Now, like I said, that may be the, might not be the most current one. I don't know. I meant to ask somebody the other day who just took that oath, um, Miss Liz, Dr. Liz Schmidt. Um, she just took that oath, what, last month? May 7th. So, you know, if you, and congratulate mom and dad, too, because they, they went through it with her. But, uh, but part of one of their oaths was that I will not play God in my decisions and what I do. As a, as a doctor, as a nurse, as a medical uh, EMT, whatever it is. Can I, let, let's talk for a minute. What have we done? Now, I'm going to get to my point in a few minutes here, but what have we done? And as Christians, as even independent fundamental Baptists, we've, we've played God. We're trying to help heal people, but we too many times we've taken God's word and we've made it, we've used it the wrong way. We've made it say what we wanted it to say. We've, we've uh, uh, by, by our own words and actions, we have removed the power of, God, of the word of God in people's lives because we have, uh, we have gone to it and, and made it, almost made it say what we thought it should say. About their lives. And you understand. Anytime I take God's word. And I use it improperly. I have just taken the power of the Holy Spirit. Out of his word. Because I've pulled him out of it. I've used it to do and say what I wanted it to say. Not what it truly says. That's so why I've got to guard myself. When I'm studying. And make sure I don't use it improperly. I, I would... I would rather die than stand here and lose the Holy Spirit's power off my life and off the life of this church. So we must guard ourselves. This is why we hear the world talk about how outdated the Bible is. It was good for the people in olden days, but it isn't relevant anymore. How many of you have heard that term? It's not relevant anymore. I've heard it more times than I want to discuss. By young kids today. <clears throat> Let's go back to our, our passage for just a few minutes. The Bible says for the word of God. Notice it doesn't say for the word of Keith. It doesn't say for the word of Ron. For the word of Jimmy. For the word of Don. It doesn't say that. It says for the word of God is. Yes. Dot, dot, dot. The word of God, we must recognize that just as these EMTs have tools, God has given us the greatest tool known to man. And unfortunately, for so many years, we've misused it. Or we've not used it, which is a misuse as well. It's collected dust in our house. You say, Brother Keith, you sure are, uh, you know, hyped up tonight? Yes, because... 
Wednesday night crowd. It, this is this is your your hardest trainers. You know when you're when you're in school and you're studying for a test and and you have a group of group of people that you know. Well, I'll do okay. It doesn't matter. You know that's your Sunday morning crowd. Your Sunday morning, Sunday night crowd are the ones that really care, but they're not sure they're going to go all the way about studying. And your Wednesday night crowd are the ones that are in every study meeting along the way until you get to that test and, and they do well. Because we're in that class tonight, and we'll be in this class for a couple weeks, about focusing on, on, on what God desires for us. How God desires for us to use His Word. Here it says the, Bible, the, the word of God, what it is, it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Quick, powerful. See, too many times, and look, I'm guilty of this. Too many times I like to tell you what I think instead of tell you what God thinks. See, what I think doesn't mean a hill of beans, but what God thinks means everything. Yes. Doesn't, look, I can give you my thoughts all day long. But they won't change your life. God's word will. It has the power. It is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 2 says, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Speaking of, uh, Isaiah is speaking of, speaking of God, Christ, God's words out of his mouth. He says, He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. Listen, when we give the word of God with boldness, when we give God's word, it becomes that sharp sword. Back in Revelation, it talks about Jesus Christ. It speaks of him, and there's a sword coming out, which is the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 23, the Bible says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Many times we wonder why, why, I mean, we're working with people so long, so hard, we're, we're witnessing to people, and we just don't seem to be getting anywhere, and we don't understand why we're not getting there. There seems to be no power in what we're doing. It's because we're, there's not enough, God, enough, not enough of God's word in it, and too much of my word in it. When I do that, I lose power. When I lose that power, look, I'm not going to see that life change. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's the power of God's word right there. That's the power that God's word has, not the power that we have. So we've got to recognize the tool that God has given us is the power. It has the power to change lives. It has the power to heal people's lives. It has the power. This is our jump bag. And it is filled to the brim with the word of God that has the power yeah. to heal, to fix things, to split things up, to, to re rehab things right here. It's quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. First Peter chapter one verse twenty-three: Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Well, what it is is quick and powerful. What it does, piercing and dividing the soul. Now I'm I'm not quoting it exactly. And some kind of squished a little bit. Piercing and dividing the soul and the spirit and the joints in the marrow. I can't get through to them, Brother Keith. I, I can't. I, I don't know what's going on. Look. Get into God's word and give, give them God's word and let it cut deep. See, where we can't get in, God's word can. Yes. Amen. Where I can't make sense, God's word can. To be the hospital God desires us to be. We must recognize our jump back. We must recognize where the power really is. 
We must recognize that it's not about what I understand about God's word. It's about my use of God's word. So many people come to me, but I don't I don't understand the word of God. No, but if you'll just use it, if you'll just obey it, it works. Right. I was talking with somebody about that today. If you just use it, it works. You don't have to understand why it works. Just recognize, understand who's doing the work. Hey. It's God. What it does, piercing the body and soul and spirit and joints and marrow. How it does it. I love this. How it does it. Because I want you to understand, and is a discerner. It discerns what the thoughts and intents of the heart. It discerns our thoughts and intents of the heart. See, it's not about what's going on the outside. It's not about what we see as a result. When a doctor goes in, he may see the result of the problem. The whole practice part is finding the actual problem. Too many times we as Christians deal with the problem and we focus so hard on the on the excuse me, the results of it. We see the results and we're so focused on the results that we don't ever see the actual problem and we can never help. But see, God's word does that for us. It discerns all that. There's been several times, even recently, that God would give me a verse and I would share it with somebody. In fact, it was uh, yesterday. I sent a text to, to a, a good friend of mine. I don't know why God, God laid his name on my heart. I sent him the text and he said, thank you, but why today? Just said, look, I'm praying for you. I love you. I appreciate you. He says, but why today? <laughs> Well, and I, and, I, and I was trying to be encouraged. I said, because some wise preacher once said uh, to obey every impulse of the Holy Spirit. To listen to the Holy Spirit. Why, let him guide me. The next text said, you'll never know what this means to me today. Because it's been a day. It's been a week. It's been a month today. But I gave him scripture. Look, he's a pastor. He's a preacher. He knows scripture. But it was the scripture that worked. It was the scripture that encouraged. It was the scripture that built him up. It had nothing to do with what I said. We don't understand why sometimes I, you, you're given a verse. And God says, hey, give that to so-and-so. And you give it to him. You go, I don't know why I'm supposed to give it to you. But hey, God's, it, it's, it's in your tool bag. See, God's jump bag is giving you. First Corinthians 14 verses 24 and 25 begins talking about those speaking in tongues. And then it says, uh, but it says this, but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all. He is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Here in 1 Corinthians, he's speaking and, and, and Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and he said, you know what? And he's talking about speaking in tongues. He said, if all of you speak in tongues, you know what? It's not going to affect him. He, is, he leaves confused in the verses prior to this. He says he leaves confused, but if all of you prophesy, preach the word, give the gospel, give the word of God, if all of you prophesy, notice what it says about it. If, but if all of you prophesy... And there come in one that believeth not. So um, a man comes in, and, and this is talking about preaching, uh, preaching the word. He said, and a man comes in that believeth not. Or he's just unlearned. He's never heard this. He is, because you're prophesying, not doing this speaking in tongues thing. He said, because you are prophesying, because you're giving the word of God. He said, he is convinced of all. It convinces and he is judged of all, not by the people. He's judged by the prophecy, the, the word of God you're giving. He becomes convinced and he becomes judged of it, convicted of it. Then what does he say? And thus 
are the secrets of his heart made manifest. Because we're given the word of God, the secrets of his heart become manifest in his life. They become evident. They become, they literally are jumping out of his chest, if you will. And he's recognizing his condition, his position. And then it says, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God. It doesn't say that he'll worship the people that are, that are speaking in tongues because that's where he was before that. He said that he will worship God. Guess what? God's word always leads back to himself. Not us. That's where it should lead. That's where it will lead. We, too many times we've used our tool the wrong way, our jump mat the wrong way. We have, we as Christians have generally done an injustice to the word of God and have given God a bad name in how we've used it. Or not used it. For example, for many years, I've seen this in my life, and I've, and I've seen it in the life of, of churches in general. For many years, and this is, this is somebody, I heard this illustration from another preacher, and when he said it, it just jumped all over me. For many years, we've seen, we may have seen a trend, a fad, or maybe even an activity that we know it does not please God. But we go to the Bible and we try to find a specific verse that nails that whatever it is. Trend, fad, activity. We go specifically looking for a verse that, that nails that. And you know, we're trying to preach against it. That's the point of it. But we go digging through the word of God, trying to find something that fits that trend that fad, whatever, whatever it is. And we're trying to find a verse that just nails it, knocks it out. Look, I've been guilty of it with teens. I've been guilty of it with adults. There's got to be something to hear about this. <laughs> I got, there's got to be. I'm going to find it. But here's the thing. When I do that, but when we do that, can I tell you what I do? I begin limiting God's word because I want you to understand God's word is timeless. Without time. You know what that means? Well, first off, the Lord is good. Psalm 100 verse 5, the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Mm -hmm. Stay with me for a minute. His word is timeless. His truth endureth to all generations generations. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23, being born again not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word which liveth and abideth forever. You know what? My Bible doesn't contain trends. It doesn't contain fads. And in most cases it doesn't contain specific activities. Because if it did over time, guess what? Those change. Fads change. As soon as you get the money to go buy whatever you wanted for that fad, it's already changed. Did that when I was in, in middle school and high school. There was a there was there was a fad that was going around, and it was uh, khaki shorts and and this paisley style shirt. <laughs> oh, I know it sounds hideous. It was. But I remember it because everybody was wearing it. And they were doctor shorts. And I don't remember the name of the shirt. But I had saved up. I mean, my parents were like, Keith, that's just a fad. You don't need it. I saved up. I'm going to go out and get it. Well, I went out. I went out with my friends. And I let my friends help me pick it out. And I even changed in the store. Wore it home. I was that excited about it. A week later, guess what? That fad was gone, and that was just totally uncool to wear. Fads change. In fact, sometimes they come back around. God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that. 
if he were to write us a book filled with trans fads and activities, there's no telling how long that book would have to be to cover it all. And at that point, it is simply a rule book, which too many times we have made the word of God instead. There you go. Look, in this jump bag, these are tools to help get a person to where they need to be to see the doctor. So the doctor might practice on them. And help them rehab and help them get back to where they need to be, right? This is so much more powerful than that. And because of my misuse, I've turned it into a rule book. And not something that deals with the heart. That, that really gets to the heart of the matter and things. It doesn't get to the actual cause. He gave us a book much more powerful than that, one that gets to the root of the problem. Does it say, look, I didn't say that we get to the root of the problem. I said it gets to the root of the problem. Yeah. Please understand what God desires us to be. God desires us to be a hospital. Mark chapter 2, when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ was a traveling hospital, healing people, providing for people, doing things for people, with no expect expectations of anything in return. But because he did that, what did they do? They followed him. God is the great physician. And if you will, in my little synopsis of a hospital here, he is the great physician. And I told you there's all these little working parts of a hospital. But the one that I didn't list because it's kind of on the outside. For the longest time, can I tell you, I thought God was going to allow me to become someone who worked in the medical field, an EMT, a first responder. I rode with a first responder when I was in middle and high school. For years, I rode with him, and it was I was just amazed at what he got to do, especially when he got to put the light on top of his car and speed to wherever he was going. I mean, come on, what guy did not like that? I mean, I was, oh! And it was, it was I mean, it, probably a light he bought at Walmart, you know? Remember <laughs> you said? It was the blue light special from Kmart, what it was, no. Uh, but he put it on, and we he he drive as fast as he could to get to to the accident scene. As soon as he heard it come up over a scanner, he was called a first responder. He took me to many of his classes so that I could start the training. So I was so interested in it. But as I was thinking about it this week. I realize that as a Christian, each one of us should be an EMT for God. We should be that one. Look, we are his hands, we are his feet. We are his, his tools here on earth. And when someone's hurting, we should be first on the, on the scene. We should be immediately going to them. We should have an answer. We should have the tools in our bag, in our jump bag, ready to go in a moment's notice. What does the Bible say? Be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks. My perversion of it, I know. So forgive me. We should be EMT. You know the main purpose of EMS is to provide for immediate medical care to the people who most need it. Without which would lead to many more fatalities. That's summing it up. That's what an EMS or an EMT worker is. They simply exist in order to give us all a better quality of life. We, I have said this and we have talked about this many times. That we are to be a spiritual hospital <coughs> to the community around us. When there is a problem... 
They need to know where to go. When there is a situation, an emergency, they need us to be on the spot coming in with answers. Not our answers, but the answers in God's word. I get it. This is a huge responsibility. But it's a responsibility that we have. You and I have this responsibility as Christians. What is it? You're the light of the world. You're not one to be hit under a bushel. But to be set so that everybody can see. You know, many people use a lighthouse as an example. Can I tell you? The lighthouse tells you where not to go. I want to be that candle that says, come here. Come here. To be an EMT for God, there must be training, intense training. And you know, we're going to start with some intense training here on Wednesday nights in Bible study. I want us to be ready. I want us to be trained. But look, the training that several of our men in here have gone through to be just that, it wasn't easy. <coughs> But I can tell you this, I'm glad they're in our service so if something happens, they know exactly what to do. Hey. As an EMT, you're trained to be ready at an emergency scene. In one of the classes, here's, here's one of here are the steps that one would go through just upon arriving at a scene. Uh, number one, BSI, which is body substance uh, isolation, scene safety, mechanism of injury, number of patients, Need for additional help. Consider manual and line immobilization of C-spine. Those are, those are the steps that you might go through in a physical emergency. You know what? what what's neat is, is God's already given me a message for, message for each one of those in a spiritual situation. A spiritual condition. That we need to have those steps ready. To treat someone in emergency. Treat someone specifically with the word of God. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see what that, that looks like in a spiritual level. That we might train to be the best EMTs for God, we can be. Now, our prayer tonight must be that we truly begin seeing our church as a hospital in the day and age that we live in. That we truly begin recognizing and understanding the importance of why we come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Why we really come. Not just to have, look, yes, we are here to encourage and have fellowship. Yes. But can I tell you, it's a whole lot more serious than that. It's a training ground so that we might be ready. Look, every class that, that Brother Jimmy and Brother Keith went to, every class that you went to was an important class, was it not? I mean, if you didn't remember something, shoo, you're in trouble the next class. <laughs> so many times we come and we sit in these pews, and, and, and I'm just as guilty as everybody in here, and I even do it up here in the pulpit. We hear it, and we apply it, and maybe we don't take it serious enough to recognize how serious our training really is. If an EMT rushed onto the scene and just treated it haphazardly or forgot or really didn't study like they ought to, you know what? They could be in some serious trouble. Look, I've got a God in heaven that's expecting of me to be a, an EMT for him and help people. And guess what? He's expecting the same thing of you. I, I, I don't want to stand before him one day when I want to hear him say, well, done thou good and faithful servant. And he'll say, you weren't responsible at all for what I gave you. I want us to be encouraged. I want to build each other up. But I also want us to be recognizing the seriousness of our training to truly be able to be on the spot ready to help somebody with the work of God. But we must see our, this as a hospital and we must see ourselves as EMTs for God. 
we must see ourselves at, in the position that God gave us. Go ye therefore into all the world and teach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the God, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Literally, go and do. Don't wait for them to come in. If a hospital waited for everybody to come in, there would be a whole lot of people dying in this world, would it not? <clears throat> I mean, Brother Mike, if, if they waited, if you waited for them to come into the fire station to tell you, hey, I got a fire at my house, by the time they got back to the fire, back to the house, it's gone. If we wait for people to come through those doors for help, it just might very well be too late. I'd hate to know how many people we've lost already outside this doors. Because we didn't have our jump back ready. We weren't trained. We hadn't trained ourselves. We were using it the wrong way. We were chasing the issue. We were just chasing the results, not the problem with the word of God. Tonight. Help me change my focus. Help me. Help me. Look, I'm, a, I'm asking for your help for me. Because too many times I get caught up in the same thing. 